so this is going to be like a very informal Q and A session. So if you have anything to add, uh, or you can add and subtract and uh, discuss and build on the the ideas. What can we learn from like architecture practice and the the things that have said? What what can we bring in or learn from that practice to to sort of fix some of the the issues? And maybe it's uh, maybe architecture doesn't actually change the the practice as as often as that we do or typography practice. I don't know. Maybe that's a reason that there's an established way of like knowledge transfer and maybe stakes are higher. You know, you're building things that, you know, that, that people are going to live in and, you know, that, that could be a reason as well. That's just a thought. That's exactly the point. In architecture, the risk of failure is very high. Uh, it might be real risk in the sense that the building falls and kills someone or uh, the risk in the investment is very high. That if you get it wrong, then you might not be able to sell your apartments or rent your shop and so on. It also means that making things is slow. You need to get your permits, you need to get your drawings. A lot of people are involved in intensive collaborative exercise. And you also need to make sure that there's a lot of standards and regulations that are kept. So it's a very tight framework within which you practice. So this combination of risk, human risk and financial risk, and a very tightly regulated environment forces a certain, uh, say, reflection in the practice. That immediately means that you try to learn much more about other, from other practice, from the past, and so on. Then the very longevity of buildings forces us to be much more aware of how they are received. The idea of traditionalism and modernity and buildings matters quite a lot because they're going to be around for 30 or 40 or 50 years. So therefore, you need to get that right, in a sense. So studies about the history of architecture then are integral in somebody studying architecture, just as engineering is and static physics are, so that they will build something that will stand up. So you're trying to combine something that has quite a lot of rigor and will relate to the regulations for a building structure. But at the same time, you're trying to design something that will respond to people's ideas of what a building should look like, what a residence should look like, and so on. And because the risk is so high, if you give someone a round apartment, then the risk of somebody adapting their behavior to live in an apartment with only round walls is actually very high. So you're really very careful about doing something like that. Therefore, you go back and try to see, well, what's the history of building apartments where you push the user behavior to unfamiliar spaces? And then you can see that the typology of buildings is actually fairly conservative in the configuration of room dimensions you have and so on. And, and that is something quite helpful. Now, if you convert this to typography, on one level you see that the risk in typography is much lower because things get published much more quickly and more easily and also because the risk is much lower. In most documents, if you get it a bit wrong, nobody will die. And, and we're excluding critical manuals or maybe some signs on the road. In most cases, it's a very low risk operation. If you can't read a book very comfortably, it's okay, you can't read the book very comfortably, but nothing terrible will happen. The other thing that this means is that the field of design can respond very quickly to social trends. And then we can see this huge diversity that allows design to respond to sub of culture, to open up different ideas of identity through the kinds of publications we produce. So you could have something that looked like the emigre publication, and it could sit alongside the equivalent New York Times typography, and one did not threaten the other but one allowed the specific demographic to identify itself with a certain kind of design. And that is uh, actually quite possible with something fairly volatile like typography. What it also allows us to do is that if there is this opportunity to change a lot, where it does not change, you see that things matter quite a lot. So if we look at our sort of handheld devices and we try to see something that has quite a lot of text, which might be a newspaper or an essay or a commentary, website, the typography of the paragraphs doesn't change. So you might have a lot of change in the navigation between documents, because the nature of the document has changed, but the nature of the paragraph, which would be an immersive experience for several seconds, actually that hasn't changed between paper and screen. And what we've seen is that regardless of all the experiments that people have conducted in the last 20, 25 years of showing text on screen, we've seen that you don't really mess with a paragraph. 
and you get a lot of experimentation how people navigate between different clusters of paragraphs, but the paragraph itself is fairly constant. The size of the lettering that people will want to read continuously is fairly constant. The length of a, an optimum line is fairly constant. We don't change these things very much. And this shows you that given the flexibility, people have found that a certain combination of type size or length of line or depth of the paragraph is fairly constant. And that is because if you're giving someone an argument, three or four or five sentences is what you want to give them. You don't want to give them 12 or 15 sentences simply because you can. And that survives. On the other hand, the nature of the document has been completely exploded on a portable device because we've lost the physical properties. We've lost any connection that tells us how long this thing is. How does it connect to other things in its set? So a magazine and paper tells me both its size, its scale, the position of the article within the set, and its relations with others. An article in a magazine website doesn't tell me anything about itself. So there you see that this opens up very different ideas of exploration and very different ideas of permanence. So I mean, to bring it up with architecture, you might see deep buildings that look very differently from the outside, but the idea of how you configure staircases or doorways actually might be quite constant. So the equivalent of a paragraph in a building are all these spaces of interaction between humans and transition between spaces. Hi, Jerry. I, I share your views on many of these. Uh, I'm going to cover some of it tomorrow as well in a more uh, uh, in another way, I guess. Uh, you mentioned about uh, how you know more kind of less less traditional ways of publishing in academia, like blog posts and videos and magazines and things like that. How that's not counted and it's not part of the KPI. I see a, a divide between you know design schools increasingly you know, subscribing to that traditional model of academia, of setting these KPIs, of publishing in scientific journals, and on the other spectrum, you know, the more kind of practical oriented schools, or maybe traditional art schools, that more kind of um, leaning towards creative practices, research in creative practices, uh, the less contextual stuff, more about visual language and style and things like that. How do you see the two kind of ends of these spectrum kind of uh, coming together? Do you see how, you know, you, you said shared methodologies. When are we going to have shared methodologies or shared resources or shared visions about the field? It, there doesn't seem to be, you know, a shared vision yet, I think. Uh, I the reason to have some sort of idea of what shared methods are exactly because there is quite a lot of diversion. Uh, I think a lot has to do with the funding of education. And that changes quite a lot from country to country. But in the, the more applied end of the spectrum, people expect, let's say, every pound, dollar, euro, whatever, uh, that they spend in education to go towards something that will directly translate to their employability. And there's a very strong strand in this in certain sectors. So I think a lot of applied uh, schools, certainly the ones coming out of our schools, try to focus in that direction. So you might try to welcome people who teach who have a direct connection to industry and can bring a reassurance of uh, understanding of where the industry practice is now. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, where you might have people who might have a longer term perspective about education, which might include research, that you might have a question of how does that research get funded? Is it part of the fees? Is it through research projects and so on? And that builds in the accreditation of research, what is good enough research to publish. And I think that is at the heart of the problem that if you are an institution that tries to build up a research profile in your staff and so on, you might have to borrow the systems of accreditation from other disciplines that are very well established, but actually are not very well uh, suited for design. Uh, we can see this a lot in countries where uh, it's very visible in the United States and in some European countries where the, uh, the promotion or progression criteria for younger, younger academics have been changing to include research outputs. 
So what do you see counts as research outputs in different countries varies hugely. Some of the stuff I showed, like publications in Emigre or I, would count in some countries. In some others, it would not. They would only count something that has a research uh, citation index. That's a problem, because none of the two can be right. Probably there's a middle ground, and there's some way for the field itself to establish what the, kind, what the criteria for this might be. Uh, again, in an environment where most of the discussion is happening online and in quite close connection with practitioners, the idea of uh, impact or citations needs to take this into account as well. That uh, you cannot count the impact of your research only by how many other academics have looked at it, but you really need to look at how many other practitioners have had an impact in this. So I think it's a little bit more complex in nuance that we would like, partly because we are such a, we're a discipline that is closely connected to applied practice, and that raises its own uh, connections, whereas most of the disciplines that have established accreditation systems tend to exist only for the disciplines. Uh, again, architecture is a very clear uh, example for us because there is a, an established accreditation system. You might study architecture anywhere you want, but unless you, you pass an exam by whichever regional body confirms you are fit to practice, you can't practice. Well, there are two more, actually. Uh, medicine and also yes. law are no, no, also indeed. very uh, practice-oriented. But I'm intentionally not mentioning medicine and law because they are very well regulated and established disciplines, whereas architecture has an element of design in it, and we can see it much closer to ours. But I think you, you, you know, you, you mentioned how you know uh, high stake, you know, architecture is. And I think Patum yeah. was mentioning that. I think that kind of uh, brings us to the question of uh, how to kind of uh, measure effectiveness of design. Sometimes and it's very difficult, and sometimes what do we mean by, you know. Uh, a user having actually served, uh, well, the design have, having actually served its purpose uh, uh, effectively, it's, you know, maybe we need to look into user, make, uh, you know, matrix about how, you, how users interact with a product or things like that to give us an indication of what makes our practice effective. I think we lack that at, at this moment or we, we don't have a clear idea of how that is played out at the moment. Uh, we do. Uh, I have a personal um, uh, slight skepticism about the use of metrics when it comes to human behavior, uh, because usually you end up measuring what your metric system want, makes it easier to measure. Uh, we see this in a lot of uh, decisions where you can measure very easily the presence of a certain font, uh, how many times a font has been served on a web page. Uh, if the choices for users for that font uh, might not be very big, then the fact that they are using that font doesn't necessarily mean that they approve of the font or that they use the font easily, they read it well. It just means that they don't have a choice. They want the content. But then the metric shows you that there is a strong demand for the font. Therefore, you might think that this confirms uh, user support for the way the font is designed. Uh, so if you're trying to say, oh, maybe that font should behave differently, should look differently, how are you going to make an argument when the metrics clearly indicate that 80% of the population of this community is using this font? And you can find a lot of cases where uh, the way that you measure something is geared towards the things that it is possible to measure more easily than the things that are uh, worth measuring. And something might not be. This relates to the establishment of these measuring uh, environments. So in an industrial environment, professional environment, you're usually tied into things that will feed into the next financial cycle. So only things that I can measure until I need to apply for the next round of budgeting counts because I need data to apply for my next budget. Uh, or if you're conducting a scientific experiment, uh, what is the funding environment for the, for the experiments that you're applying for? If it allows you to, say, apply for funding that will pay for one researcher for three months, you're going to design an experiment that will be done in three months by one researcher, even though actually the things that are worth measuring might take three researchers six months. There's no funding for this, you're not going to do it. So lots of the user testing that we see 
in design is really prescribed by these kind of limitations. And of course, then researchers are pretty smart people. They're going to find a rationale to make the experiment sound solid, even though if you speak to them, they might say, yeah, OK, that's useful. But actually, it's not the really useful thing. What I really want to see is what kind of text people read. But I can't get the data for this because it is sort of proprietary to a company that serves them. So I would really like to know, for example, uh, things like I showed a picture of Medium later. So if I publish a story on Medium, I can see how many people have seen it. And I get a percentage that says how many people read it. So the technology somehow calculates the speed at which through sc people scroll through it or which they abandon it. And they stop. Now, I'm sort of privileged with regard to this story because I can see how many people abandoned my story halfway through or just skimmed through it. In a lot of other publishing platforms, I don't have that kind of metrics. But I don't know at which point in the story they stopped. I don't know how that algorithm works. And I don't know, maybe a lot of them stopped at that paragraph, which might mean that that paragraph is badly written. And then I can go and edit it and then increase my scores of people reading through. That kind of intelligence is not available to people. Now, companies have it because we know that they change the way they, our, our interaction with text works, but they're not making this available to us. But surely, you know, every time I scroll through my Guardian app, they know at which stories I read, when do I stop reading them, and so on. But that information would be really critical if I wanted to say, what is an optimum size of a news article? Headline and a picture. Even, even in The Guardian, that would be terrible. Even in The Guardian. Yeah. OK. Any more questions? Wait. Can you hear me? Uh, hi, Wayne here from Malaysia. Um, Gabby, when as you go through the list, one can easily have the impression that uh, this usually best accomplished within some kind of established institution with uh, lots of budget and all that. But I'm thinking on the other side, uh, more kind of, if I can call the word, use the word movement. I mean, in history, you have. Um, like example, immigrate, you know, these people have limited budget, uh, <laughs> just make use of whatever technology they have. And in actual fact, I think designers are hardly policy makers. <laughs> we don't sit there and approve big budget and all that. Um, uh, is it just within the established uh, institution or big player, like big foundries who can afford some of this research and all that? Uh, actual fact is that we, uh, well, employee or just individual designers scattered doing small little things uh, but with the social media platform and a lot of the software that is available we can actually do a lot of things maybe you can share a bit about that your thoughts on um, yeah uh, i hope i've understand the comment correctly but uh, i think different kinds of design have very different kinds of impact mm -hmm. and th there is a huge amount of practice that really has no other impact other than feeding into the culture ideas about identity, currency, modernity, tradition, and so on. A lot of the stuff that has to do with branding and commercial practice is really about this, in reinforcing ideas of belonging to certain communities. Oh, I have this kind of phone, or I buy this kind of clothes. Therefore, I associate myself with the ideas that come with this. And sort of that's a fairly fast um, rotating network, and it sort of stops there. It's very helpful in telling you things about how the culture sees itself. Uh, and I think we can observe very much the ideas of uh, modernity uh, and tradition and internationalism, regionalism, localism reflected in design. Uh, if you walk in the streets in any Asian metropolis, you'll see in the advertising these kind of tensions. And I see it a lot. What kind of models uh, do you present to consumers about how they should look and how they should behave? Uh, that, that's quite uh, a notable feature. There is, however, you mentioned the other level where you mentioned policy and things having a real impact. 
that comes either through signal projects, we tend to have um, an interaction with authority that is not a design authority. That's the interesting thing. Uh, or uh, specific technology-driven solutions that, again, are not necessarily chosen because of design qualities. And that is the interesting factor that designers need to engage with people who are not designers. Even, even within design, I mean, we have architecture, which, is, which we mentioned, which is kind of slightly different from type design and graphic. Okay, but I'm talking about, for example, um, I showed the sign of motorway signs. So if you say, uh, we're going to build a brand new highway from the airport uh, to Colombo, which there is one and there's more building coming on, uh, then to say that there's going to be a new sign system for it that will show uh, three scripts in, uh, in balance, and would have an integrated system of associated signs for exits and so on. That's a political act. Because this says we didn't just build a road, we built something that provides service to the community and it is of an international level. It's at the standards expected. If you have something where cars are moving very fast, you need to have an integrated size system that works to certain international standards. And it's a political choice. And because it will cost a lot of money, you have to speak to someone who comes from a political background, might have a very big budget to handle, and they're going to split that budget between the guy that says, I need more concrete, and you saying, I need reflective signs. So there's a very interesting example there. Uh, the same kind of thing applies in any environment that has multiple scripts, and you might have, say, one script that might be native and one that might be geared to international visitors. Um, the Gulf area is very uh, clear in this, where you have a lot of uh, hub areas, international airports where people uh, land, transit, go on. So you might have at least Arabic and English showing, and one is a native script, and that the other is an essential script for travelers to find the right gate. And you want them to find the right gate, otherwise the airplane doesn't take off. Yeah. So in these cases, the design, again, is a political act, because the balance between the two scripts uh, will show the idea of the authority about the relationship between travelers and uh, local communities. And the nature of the design, the style of the design, not the details, the overall style, will show ideas about the integrity of style in each of the two scripts. So if you say I'm designing, say, the Arabic to look very much like the Latin, that might place it in a subservient position. If you say I'm designing the Arabic so it is uh, respecting the inherent qualities of the script and places it alongside stylistically the, the Latin, so with integrity for its own uh, qualities, then that says that this is, you know, can be designed for this kind of environment, a new kind of document, well enough so that it stands on its own. It doesn't need to make reference to the Latin script. And again, that's a political decision. So the argument for a specific kind of design is really a political argument. Because it says the culture has enough depth in it to produce a kind of design for the Arabic script that will work in an international context for a kind of design that is a science system that is entirely new. And that is, I think, quite important. And you find this in a lot of areas where there's a lot of development. Yeah, so the, the question is, it seems like the best body to get that kind of job done are the more established institution and as designers to work under that, or big foundries where they can afford um, lots of budget, big budget in research and all that. So the question is, can a smaller um, um, designers agency or individual have a role in that as a leading, you know? Uh, I would think that if we look at a lot of uh, cultural projects, there usually are consultants assigned to them. And they might be there to ensure that uh, certain cultural dimensions are kept. So if you're designing a museum, there might be some people who come from cultural services, the Ministry for Culture, or a university, who are there as consultants to ensure that the design solution respects the specific requirements. So that can be a way that you can have a partnership between people who have an expertise in the cultural dimension of the project and a design agency. And then the design agency doesn't need itself to have that kind of expertise because it's not really its job necessarily to have that kind of expertise. Its job is to ask the questions. 
So what you'd want is when the briefs are being designed, are being put together, for there to be space to ask these questions. And that's always a big problem, that the typographic dimension of the brief tend to be the last bit on the brief. So if you're talking about, say, the sign making, the cost of the signs, of introducing the signs, of arranging them, putting them up and making them is the big bit in the budget. And the design of the letter forms might be the slowest, the lowest bit. And that's a bit of a problem, because you might need to start with the letters and try to see, well, unless I figured out what the right kind of design configuration of the letter forms is, I cannot make decisions about the, sign of the, si the size of the signs. So that kind of stuff is important. So the design agency, regardless of its size, has a requirement to ask the right kind of questions and then pass these on into the brief making stage, then educate, help educate the client to say, yes, that part of the brief needs the right kind of funding and support. Yeah. Yes, uh, no, it's sort of uh, relating to what we have been discussing and uh, we should sort of uh, discuss the training context with the, the sort of animation process. Right? So something that uh, I have sort of experienced is when the context is, if, if the context is confusing and not that interesting in a way, you know, I'm just like generally using the, the interesting part, but the opportunities that we see are, are Then how do you navigate that as the interface when you're interpreting the context the the context? Uh, can you run this by me again? I've lost you. Yeah, so we so for example we can like take about the, the design sort of scene here and sort of look at the, the, the context, right? So the, the issues uh, Actually, to sort of streamline the question, how do you sort of deal with that? Sort of, you know, trying to uh, integrate the context, but becoming a demand supply school or producing. Uh... Uh, okay, so you're talking about sort of, uh, schools that essentially might treat students as customers. Yeah, yeah. So and the education is a commodity. Yeah. I'm, I'm quite anachronistic in this. I don't think that students are customers. So this sounds like a joke, but in India, for instance, where you know, for instance, all the R experience might be a lot of well-funded design schools are private ones, hmm. which most definitely treat the student as the customer. So, okay, yeah. so there is no, there has to be a way in which, you know, one can kind of deal with that because there is no running away from that kind of system. If one uh, does plan to teach in India, for I think the, it is a problem if you want to do mass teaching. Uh, so I think there's always, this, this sounds a bit elitistic, it's wrong. Uh, I don't think you can change a lot of the people drastically quickly. So if you say, I'm going to try to do things differently, and I'm going to, first of all, respect students, because actually I'm insulting someone if I say, you are only a pocket of money for me. That is demeaning and insulting. Uh, if I say, I need your pocket of money because I have children that I need to feed, uh, and my time is worth something, but what you're buying is my time and my care, you're not buying anything else. That transaction needs to be very clear. It's still a transaction, but you're buying my attention and my time. And in return, I sort of have the right to expect your attention. And that's where the transaction ends, which gives me both the right to give you a distinction and to fail you. But then we're both aware of this. And I think you can do this and say, the reason I'm doing this because I'm offering the opportunity to, uh, to realize your potential. The problem with a customer-orientated uh, model of education that I have to prescribe exactly what it is you're getting. It's also quite odd because we're having all of this uh, noise about diversity and inclusion and all of that stuff and it becomes almost a completely isolated discussion 
because yes, diversity is not only, uh, oh, I'm going to get people who look different in the classroom. It means that each of these people, regardless of how they look, have different learning profiles, they have different learning interests, different needs, and I need to adjust what the way I teach them and what they get out of it to their own specific circumstances. But that's a bit more difficult. And that means also that instead of uh, treating students as numbers and also teachers as numbers, I need to treat everybody as a human being with their own individuality. Now, the teachers as numbers comes into it because if I have a contract that says, you're going to do, Keith is laughing, yeah. you have you know, so many hours of this. And really, people like Keith and me have to write down specific numbers of hours that you will do in your experience as a student. Uh, then I can say the act of teaching is also the delivery of these specific hours. And I can fire me because I'm old and expensive and hire you because you're young and cheap. And you will deliver the same content, right? Because it has flattened completely the experience of education. And on one level, you might say, it shouldn't be that the education experience is hidden and esoteric. It's not something in a black box in my head. I should make as much of it open as possible. But there must, have, there must be something that has to do with the interpretation the teacher uh, adds to the specific challenges for the student and how they enable each person to do this. And that has a lot of the experience to enable this more diverse community to really realize this diversity, rather than just say, oh, I've got them in the classroom. Now I'm going to teach them all the same. Uh, and that, uh, a very good example of this is things that have to do with special learning needs. So uh, older people, like Mothu and me, yeah. would remember that you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago in a classroom, uh, somebody who would now would be classified as dyslexic, dyspraxic, and so on, would be just be labeled an idiot and would be ignored by the education system. Uh, and now we would have diagnosed them in five minutes and say, okay, that person needs this kind of support or this different way of learning and so on. Uh, but that means that then you need people have the training to do this, you need to have the time to work with students and so on. So what we see is this paradox, that we have much higher levels of diagnosis of people as having special needs, but not necessarily that they come with extra time for the staff to get the training and to spend the time with the students. So if you've got dyslexia and you have taken an exam and I say you have 15 extra minutes, if you don't know what to do with your two hours, you don't know what to do with your two hours and 15 minutes. If you don't know how to write an essay, you don't know how to write an essay given an extension. You need a completely different way of structuring your learning and your writing. But that means I need to pay attention to you as a person rather than a model of a student has dyslexia. And I need to change the way I teach and support you. And that takes time and effort and someone who has built the experience to do it. Uh, it doesn't fit the model of a spreadsheet. Okay, I'm done. Good. Thank you.